When I was at university, I attended a new church which met in someone's house. This was a very exciting time because the church was trying to establish, it wasn't an Anglican church, it was trying to establish what it believed and wanted to teach about all kinds of different subjects. And one of those was its approach to money. What should the church teach about Christians and what they do with their possessions and their money? The church didn't have a vicar, it had a group of elders. And the way they decided that they would approach this issue was that three of the elders would give presentations to the church about how they felt the Bible approached the issue of generosity, money, and giving. And these presentations turned out all to be very different from each other, and I've never forgotten them for reasons that may well become obvious in the next few minutes. The first elder who got up to talk about this gave a very passionate exposition of the idea of tithing. Tithing is the idea that 10% of your income should be given to God. And he started to teach about how throughout the Old Testament in particular, God's people were expected to tithe. And in the New Testament, how much more should we do that? And he gave plenty of examples of that from both the Old and the New Testament. And then the second elder got up and started to give his presentation, taking actually a very different approach, which was rather more focused on the New Testament. He took as his text a verse from Galatians chapter 3, which says Christ, Jesus Christ, has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. And so his case was that all of this 10% stuff belonged in the time of the law and the Old Testament, and that Jesus, in all that he has done for us, has set us free from all that, and so we don't, as Christians, need to go along with that kind of legalistic stuff any longer. No. These rules in the law are just oppressive things that Christians shouldn't pay much attention to anymore. And Jesus has set us free. We need to live free. We don't need any of that. And so, you know, if we felt that the 10% was actually a bit much, that God didn't worry too much about that because Jesus has set us free. The third elder then got up and gave his presentation. And he, I, I guess, was a more kind of pragmatic, practical, dare I say, balanced sort of individual who said that, that in some ways, both of those things had a lot of things to say. But yes, Christ has set us free. But actually, 10% might be quite a good disciplinary way of looking at it. That is something to work towards, a target for, uh, for us who were perhaps not used to giving. And then he particularly wanted to emphasise this verse in the passage that Claire has just read to us, where it says that God loves a cheerful giver. And he says, well, that's the key thing. And he pointed out the fact that the word cheerful, when you look at the original Greek of the passage, is the word hilaros, from which we get the word hilarious. And so he said, well, what God is teaching us in the New Testament is that God loves a hilarious giver. And so what we ought to do is to really look forward to the point in every service where the collection plate comes around and we ought to be thinking inside ourselves, hallelujah, praise the Lord, here comes the collection plate, let's do it, bring it on.
Well, at the end of these three presentations, I have to say that I and the entire rest of the church were very confused. <laughs> because, you see, we wanted to believe that all three of these guys were right, even the third one, actually. But yet it didn't seem to add up. There seemed to be different things being taught there. And so we need to approach this in a way that doesn't confuse us. And actually, having said all of that, I would like to suggest to you that I think that there were some things in there which each of them had missed and which perhaps we do need to think about and to take on board as we think about, well, what does the Bible teach us about possessions and money and generosity and all of the subjects we want to be thinking about in the next month? Well, there are several points. The first is this idea of tithing and of 10%. The idea of giving a tithe to God is actually nothing whatsoever to do with the law. The first time that the idea appears in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 14, where Abraham meets Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem. And the passage says this, this is Genesis 14, verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now... <clears throat> This is two very wealthy people in the ancient world who are using this idea to bless each other. And that idea is very important. We meet it again a few chapters later in the life of Jacob and in the story of Jacob seeing heaven in a dream. And this is what Jacob says when he wakes up. Then Jacob made a vow saying... If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Now, <clears throat> We understand that those stories happened several hundred years before Moses gave the law to God's people. So the idea of giving a tenth to God predates the law by several hundred years. It's as if God is saying through these patriarchs who made a covenant with him, that he was trying to hardwire something into people who were made in his image, which was going to be universally important. So the idea of tithing isn't legalistic or to do with the law, but to do with something else that God is trying to say. Secondly, I'd want to say that we look at this issue very often from the wrong end. What we are told in the Bible is not that God demands 10% of what we have. What we are told is that God, in his generosity, allows us to keep and manage nine-tenths of everything that he gives us. Now that's different, that's pretty generous. And that the other tenth, as in that story of Abraham and as in that story of Jacob, is actually for blessing others with. 
So it's all looking outwards. So there is a point in this idea of 10%, but it isn't a legalistic demand on the part of God, and this is particularly important, it's not the role of the church to go around banging people around the ear holes with a legalistic demand. So that there's something seriously wrong where pastors of churches walk up and down saying, you guys need to give 10% of your income to the church. That isn't how it works. God's ways are based on his generosity and provoking a response to his grace. Not by asking for legalistic things. But it does mean that if people do that, then there seems to be uh, an abundance which covers everything. And if you've ever encountered Mike Moss at the time of a gift day here in this church, you will know that he has repeatedly said that if every single member of this church gave 10% of their income to St. Peter's, all our financial problems would be over and much more. And actually, I think he's right. But then, what about this issue of the hilarious giver? Well... <clears throat> If you look at the original Greek word in that sentence, the Greek adjective is hilaros, which does indeed give us the word hilarious in our language. But if you look up in an ancient Greek dictionary how you should translate that word, you'll find that it's translated by words like propitious, appropriate. You can even translate it at peace with oneself. One translation you won't find is creased up with laughter. <laughs> Some of us used to have friends whose name was Hillary, didn't we? It's a girl's name and a boy's name too, actually. And that's what it means. You know, appropriate, propitious, at peace with yourself. What Paul's trying to say in that passage is that what God loves is not someone who bounces up and down and praises God because the collection plate's on its way, but someone who is actually, has, has come to a place where they're at peace and, and, and happy with their own generosity. In other words, if you try to give 10% of your income and you're very, very reluctant to do it and it's a horrible experience of discipline and whatever, then don't do it. If you're happy to give 3% and to be at peace with that offering, then that's actually something that God can love. And yes, you know, we've been set free from these legalistic rules. But let's be at peace with a level of generosity that we can actually manage. God loves that kind of giving. So that we don't actually come to give with bad grace. We come to be pleased about what we give. So, if we answer, have to answer the question, why should we be generous, there are a whole list of answers, but these are, I would think, the main ones. First of all, because it allows us to resemble the God who is generous and gracious. We all want to be more like God, more like Jesus. But you can't do that without becoming Generous like God and like Jesus. You can't be a person who kind of gives nothing and say that you're trying to grow as a Christian and become more like the Lord. 
Generosity allows us to resemble the God who is supremely generous and gracious to us. But also because if it's indeed true that this kind of 10% notion is hardwired into us as people who are made in God's image, then that just allows us as individuals, as a church, and I think as a nation too, that we can enjoy a sense of abundance if that's what's coming in. You know, it, it, the maths don't work, do they, if you're good at maths, as some of you are. You know, that giving into this pot of 10% actually then supplies everybody? Well, actually, that's what God says, and it seems to work. And then, I wonder if you noticed what that verse in Corinthians after the one about the cheerful giver says, because it's really quite interesting in describing the normal Christian life. I'll read it to you slowly, but I challenge you to get any more alls or everys into this verse. This is 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now, I challenge you to get any more alls or everys into that verse. And all and every means all and every. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, <coughs> having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And so what <clears throat> that attitude of generosity and of growing generosity in ourselves as individuals and as a church will do is that it will begin to bless initially our church. It will certainly begin to spill over and bless the community around us as it is already doing here. And if the church got its act together in the nation to actually bless the nation in abundant ways that we haven't yet even thought about. That's what God has in mind. And that's why we should be generous. And so, over the coming weeks, can we just think and pray about that? There isn't a kind of legalistic approach to giving or anything like that in this church, and I certainly wouldn't allow it while I'm vicar. But we do need to think about what our response to God's love, graciousness, and his own generosity is. And to try and reflect that in the accounts of our church as we look at them year after year. And that as we see God providing more and more, that that will begin to spill out far beyond the walls of this church so that we can be a blessing far beyond anything we could possibly do just as individuals trying to be generous people.